So all I heard in that entire thing was your dreams were crushed of flying the greatest fighter in the world, which is the Viper. So I knew uh, I knew you were going to say something <laughs> foolish like that. I was just saying that De Destiny <laughs> knew that my skills were uh, were better utilized than in an air superiority fighter. little bit about your process getting hired because that is one thing that I, I get asked a lot like hey how do I go fly fighters in South Carolina or Alabama or wherever it might be you got to go out there and rush a unit can you talk about that process the complexities of it and just kind of a broad brush how that works because for those who are listening bogeydope.com we'll get to it here in a little bit but that's gonna be a big helpful piece that I think if you're interested in doing it you're going to go there. So if you can tell us just a little bit about what your process was like. Sure. So reality is that that is where Bogado came from, just in the sense that the process is not well advertised and it's, it is confusing. And we were trying to sort of consolidate that information to make it easier for people to, to find the information going forward. So the, the big picture overview of, of how the process works is that each individual guard squadron, at least, uh, is sort of its own organization. Uh, it does its own hiring, which means that it follows its own HR policy. It handles application process its own way. It will advertise uh, openings its own way. And so what happens in Alabama, as you said, is going to be different than in South Carolina, uh, even though they're the same jets that both fly F-16s, but the process of which they hire people might be slightly different. And that, that is true for all 175 different flying squadrons in the Guard and Reserve. So there's a lot of opportunity out there, but also a lot of different ways of doing business. The requirements for all these, at least for a UPT slot, uh, are generally the same. So you gotta take the AFOQT, so Air Force Officer Qualifying Test. Uh, you gotta take the TBAS, which is basically a hand-eye coordination test. And then you're sending a cover letter, a resume. You're more likely gonna have some sort of civilian flying experience with a private pilot, at least. Uh, on there, and then a couple of our little cats and dogs here and there, letters of recommendation, and then college transcripts. But that's about it. But they they'll all be in different formats. As far as some will want it in the PDF version, some will want a paper copy, some will want video uh, stuff to go with it. And so it's all just a little bit different. And what Bogey Dope tried to do is just consolidate all that information, so you see exactly what units are hiring when what they require and when their application deadlines are going to be. So that didn't exist when I was going through, it was basically a spreadsheet of all that information. But once you send in your application data, uh, you might also rush the unit, as you mentioned. Rushing unit, the, the term rush is basically from you know Greek life, if you went to a college with uh, fraternities and sororities of trying to put a face with a name, allowing people to meet you. Uh, understand who you are, what your story is, and and if you'd be a good fit for them culturally, because when they hire somebody, they're really looking to hire somebody for the next 20 years. And so it's, it's sort of joining a family and a team atmosphere that you're going to become a part of. And so that's sort of part of the application process as well. It's different for every squadron as far as how they handle that. But combine those things together, and then eventually they're going to narrow down a field of, of a lot of applicants down to about 10 to interview. And when they interview, at that point, it's it's who is really sort of the best fit for that culture going forward. They might have one slot available per year, uh, typically for fighter squadrons, that's the case. For heavy units, since it's a crew aircraft that does have twice as many pilots in there, they'll typically hire a few more uh, throughout the year. Uh, but then if you're hired, then they say, hey, you got the job, but now you got to pass your medical security background check and all pilot training. You can still wash out potentially uh, but if you don't, then you come back to that unit uh, going forward. So we probably just at the beginning, standard fire pilot answer applies probably to most of this, which is it depends. Totally. But in your, yeah, but in your, yeah, but in your scenario, how long was it like, from the time you graduated college to the time you're walking in the door at pilot training? Well, I got sort of delayed a little bit uh, for me. So I had what I thought was everything was lined up perfect to walk into one of these spots right like before I even graduated college. So at the time I was living in North Dakota, middle of nowhere, 
Uh, and my first flight instructor, uh, when I started doing my civilian ratings, told me about the guard. I had no idea what the guard was. It's like most people sound way too good to be true. And he started telling me about it. And as soon as I heard about it, I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. And so the first place I applied was the South Dakota Air National Guard, uh, right next door flying F-16s and was fortunate enough to get picked up. Um, and then while waiting for someone to call me and, and tell me that, uh, I was going off the pilot training actually got a call from their commander at the time saying that I've been medically disqualified uh, for a, a shoulder injury uh, in college playing baseball. And so I was like, holy crap, I had no idea that was going to be a disqualifying thing. I had to start the whole process over again, had to go get surgery. So I get a waiver to essentially start all over. And then after I started over, that was another two year process or so to get picked up again afterwards. I was fortunately able to get picked up by an F-15 unit after that and, and start the whole process over. So for me, it went from, you know, starting applications junior year, my college year to going to pilot training when I was like 25 uh, kind of thing. So older compared to the active duty side of things where guys are leaving straight from college but it is absolutely not uncommon. And for a lot of people that we help at Bogito, a lot of people are finding out about this, maybe a little late or whatever the case is, you never know when the bug is gonna hit you. And so we help a lot of people that are 27, 28, up to 33 uh, is sort of the age cutoff right now for UBT of, of guys getting in and, and wanting to serve. So all I heard in that entire thing was your dreams were crushed of flying the greatest fighter in the world, which is the Viper. So God, I knew, uh, I knew you were going to say something <laughs> foolish like that. That's just saying that De destiny That's knew that my skills were, uh, were better utilized than in an air superiority fighter. Yeah. Well, we're about to talk about the mission of the, the Eagle here. Cause I haven't had anyone on the podcast yet we talk about the Eagle, but still kind of, uh, what have you guys, I want to talk about bogey dope a little bit more in the process. What is the oldest person you've seen go through and get hired by a unit? Have you seen anyone get age waivers? Is that a thing? Yeah, so age waivers are, are actually quite common. Uh, so the the max age to go to pilot training in the Air Force recently changed from 30 to 33. And so uh, and the reason I changed that was because they were basically rubber stamping all age waiver approvals anyway. And so it's like, you know what, let's just raise the age, uh, max age on there. And that way we'll have to deal with less age waivers. Now, that being said, there's still people that are going to be over 33 when they start UBT and potentially need an age waiver. And I, in my experience, have never seen anyone get denied that. Really, it's just a matter of can you convince a unit to hire you if you're going to be a little bit older when there's more than likely much younger applicants that are just as qualified um, than you and kind of thing. So, as the word gets out more and more about these guard and reserve opportunities, there's more and more applicants, which means that there's just more opportunities for squadrons to hire someone that maybe doesn't require more paperwork uh, on there. So it's not a difficult thing to get. Probably the oldest person I've seen uh, truly get hired and get an age waiver is 35 uh, out there, which means that they're not even starting UPT until like 36, 37. So that's a pretty, pretty old person getting started in the grand scheme of, of this career field. Uh, but if the air force is like, Hey, if you guys want to, to hire this person, then who are we to stop you as long as the person can make it through. So is that, a, that's an air force level waiver. It's not the reserves of the guard bureau that owns that. Uh, well, it'll be an independent, it'll be independent to that specific branch per se. So like the national guard okay. bureau or the U S air force or the air force reserve would be the one that would approve that. Uh, but it's essentially, especially for a guard unit specifically, it's more of like the unit is signing off on this person. And so if they are willing to submit an age waiver for somebody, it is very unlikely that the big brother Air Force will turn that down just based on the fact of, hey, if that's the person you want, then you can have them. As long as they can pass everything, you can get them. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, I know it's definitely a process, but there's so many young guys and gals out there that are trying to like navigate it. And again, bogeydope.com. I found your website a few years ago. I was like, man, this is really handy because you have all the information you need there as far as when the hiring boards are. Because again, like you mentioned, every unit is different. So you have to go find their website. It's in a different spot on the website. If it's even there, you guys have put up there, hey, this is when the board is, the contact as well as a lot more information. If we, before we kind of, I want to talk about your career, but before we kind of transition to that, if there was one piece of advice you could give to a young person or 
an old person who's going down this path and starting to rush units, what would that be? Uh, well, like you said before, it all depends. It depends on that person's background, but the earlier someone can get started, the better. Um, and what I mean by that is even if you can start right now, if you're in college and you recognize that this is the path you want to go down, uh, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. And right now we focus on guard and reserve opportunities, but we'll be expanding out to active duty opportunities, not just in the Air Force, but Marine Corps, Army, Navy, that kind of stuff. Because we recognize that not everyone either wants to do the Guard and Reserve or can get a slot in the Guard and Reserve as it's becoming more and more competitive. And so if this is something that you want to do, start getting the information now about the best path for you and, and, the, and the goals that you have uh, out there. Because these things are becoming very competitive uh, down there and luck and timing will be a big part of it. So if you can be ready and have the most competitive application you could possibly have ready to go and you just happen to be, you know, at the right place at the right time, that's where these opportunities happen. You know, I was hired at a unit that had no connection, thought I had zero chance of getting hired there because it wasn't from the state or area or uh, any of that kind of stuff. And it just so happened that I was lucky enough that the right people saw my applications and it made an impression on them that year. Uh, whereas the next year or against other applicants, it maybe wouldn't have. And so, uh, making sure that you are ready as, for as many opportunities to get picked up as possible is the best way of optimizing your chances to do that. Gotcha. And again, it depends, but uh, expectation management here, I think, is a big piece of it. I mean, your timeline, if had it worked out, you going to South Dakota would have been pretty quick based on the people I've talked to and the buddies I've had that have gone from college or job into UPT and into flying. What do you think, or can you even say, like, what is like an average timeline from like when you start this to when you're winged? Um, it again, it depends, as you mentioned, but um, I would say on average, from what we see, probably the the average age of most guard or reserve UPT applicants going to pilot training will probably start around age like 27 ish. Kind of thing and so you'll get some guys that have full-fledged civilian careers uh, or airline pilots already that decide that this is something they want to do they didn't realize it was an opportunity before they thought the only way they could have done it was going to the academy and, and unless you know you want to uh, fly and serve in the military when you're in high school you know the academy isn't the way to do it and rotc maybe isn't a way to do it unless you knew about that in college and so OTS slots for the active duty are very hard to come by too. And there's very few opportunities to, to do that depending on the year. And so some people may find out about this late, which isn't uncommon for guard and reserve uh, applications. Uh, or you might get some people that are, are already enlisted in that particular unit that were enlisted, took a little bit longer to get their college degree because they were balancing military obligations uh, with getting their degree. And now they're graduating at 24, 25 and just getting picked up after a year or two of applying um, and then starting from there. So uh, the big thing to take away from this is it's very rare to get picked up on like your first swing of the bat. Most people are doing shotgun applications to every unit that interests them. If you want to be a fighter pilot, apply to every single fighter unit. If you want to fly heavies, apply to every single heavy unit. Uh, if you don't care, apply to everything. Right. If you want to fly only in one region of the United States, apply only to that region of the United States, but apply to all those units that are available out there just to increase your chances, because more than likely this is going to be a couple year process. Uh, and a few people will get in on the first try, but more than likely you're going to be applying several places, interviewing several places. And then fortunately, you know, again, luck and opportunity will intersect and uh, you'll be able to, to get picked up. Yeah, no doubt. There's a lot to digest there and to go through. And again, bogeydope.com, that's a great resource that Slap and his team's put together to help guide you through the process if you're looking to pursue the Guard and Reserve and then expanding into different branches and different careers. So excited to see what you guys are going to do with that. And I'm sure it's going to come back up in the remainder of this podcast. But I want to transition a little bit and back up to you going through pilot, tra uh, pilot training and then into the...